comes to safety and tolerability in this phase two snapshot, it's pretty reassuring. Local irritation scores were low, withdrawals for adverse events were absent, and laboratory signals were unremarkable. The endocrine footprint that topical dutastride had was very small and consistent with the pharmacokinetics. So I've already made videos on this that shows a signal, a sign, that topical dutastride at various concentrations may work. Now, if you want my opinion, I would say if you're not too concerned about systemic absorption, 0.1% is a sort of good starting point. Hey guys, before we continue this video, I would like to mention that we now have liposomal monoxidal sulfate on my website, phologens.com, F-O-L-L-I-G-E-N-Z.com. And if the order queue is available and open, you can order it there. We're running it as a cosmetic. There are other sort of botanicals inside of this particular topical that are pretty helpful when it comes to conditioning the hair. So that's at phologens.com, F-O-L-L-I-G-E-N-Z.com. That's F-O-L-L-I-G-E-N-Z dot com. Go check it out and maybe even try it out. See you there. Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another study that we're going to be looking at today involving the use of topical dutasteride. Now, the title of this study is, quote, a randomized double-blind placebo and active controlled phase two study to evaluate the safety and efficacy of novel dutasteride topical solutions, 0.01%, 0.02%, and 0.05% in male subjects with androgenetic alopecia, unquote. And it's from the authors Verinda Kuma Pungati et al. Now, in this particular study, we're seeing some pretty good cases to be made for the use of topical dutasteride, primarily at the highest concentration studied in this particular paper at 0.05%, where it seemingly outcompeted one milligram oral finasteride. Now, this study is very robust because you have five arms in this study, and you have that sort of comparison between placebo, and another oral treatment outside of the topical 5-alpha reductase inhibition use. So, primarily, everyone performed better than the placebo group, which is more so interesting for the topical dutasteride than it is with oral finasteride, because there's tons of literature that validates the use of oral finasteride and even topical finasteride, but that same sort of rich literature isn't present for topical dutasteride. So it is very well welcomed to have such a study as this that essentially says, hey, if you're using topical dutasteride at these specified doses in this study, you should perform better than not using anything at all. But it also is very surprising to me that such low concentrations of topical dutasteride somehow beat out oral finasteride. That is the surprise here, at least for me. Now, this might seem like a sort of limitation of the study, but the study mostly relied on patient reported satisfaction. So they simply surveyed the patients to see, okay, out of these particular groups, who's happy with what? And it tended to be the case that the 0.05% topical dutasteride group were happier. They had better sort of perceptions when it came to their hair loss. And we also had investigator photographic scores that tracked with a sort of objective measure when looking at the scalp. Now, this study didn't use a phototrichogram, and the authors at one point even seemed to acknowledge that as a sort of limitation. However, they did use a sort of microscope device that enabled the researchers to precisely track hair growth patterns between the different groups. So they used this specific device called a DinoLite Digital microscope camera. This was for them to assess target area hair count and target area hair width. So they start off by clipping a 1.9 centimeter square target area at the vertex to around 0.5 to 1 millimeter worth of hair. And then they marked the center of that area so they could precisely track that area over time. They standardized their magnification lens between 60 times and 200 times with that sort of specific DinoLite digital microscope camera tool that I mentioned before. And it's a really cool tool because they are using a bright LED light to kind of give them a good look up and close to see potentially if there's any 
vellus hairs that might be growing too, because vellus hairs themselves also influence target area hair count. The checkpoints in the study were obviously at baseline, so when they came in, then at 12 weeks, and then after that, 24 weeks or six months out into the study, the end point of the study. Again, there were no phototrichograms that were used in this specific paper, and there was no trichoscopy report. That maybe would have provided more precise diagnostic and pathophysiological details to the authors, but instead they have to rely on this sort of macro photography tool. At the highest concentration, being 0.05%, the mean increase in hair density was approximately plus 75 hairs per centimeter square, compared to plus 41 hairs per centimeter square with oral finasteride. And when it came to the placebo, the placebo group had no change from their baseline. Statistically, the comparison of 0.05% dutasteride against oral finasteride at 1 milligram reached a significance or a p-value of 0.0083, which supports the claim that at least in this six-month window, topical dutasteride can generate greater density gains than oral finasteride. But when we look at week 12, the separation was less striking, though 0.05% topical dutasteride was already statistically better than the placebo. And this temporal pattern is suggesting to us that this drug being topical dutasteride requires consistent application over several months to build its effect. And this is obvious, right? Same thing with oral finasteride. You have to be taking it semi-frequently, at least daily or every other day, for it to have some sort of effect. Obviously, this is going to be the case with any sort of hair loss treatment that we have at this current moment. When hair shaft thickness, or the hair shaft width, was examined, the differences were a bit more muted. By week 24, the 0.05% topical dutasteride group improved hair width significantly when it came to placebo. Obviously, again, placebo is not getting any sort of treatment, and if anything, they're doing worse over time. However, when comparing 0.05% topical dutasteride to 1 milligram oral finasteride, there didn't seem to be any sort of difference when it came to total area hair width or that hair shaft thickness. So, in other words, dutasteride's edge seems to be more robust when it comes to hair density. So, hair density meaning the amount of hair per given area of measurement. But there didn't seem to be any sort of improvement when it came to hair shaft caliber. And this is important for interpreting cosmetic outcomes when it comes to coverage. Because let's say that topical dutasteride, for whatever reason, had an improvement on the hair width and the hair count. Well, the hair width allows the hair itself to cover more area, thus improving its coverage. So you can style it better and have a better sort of cosmetic outcome. Even if you have the same Norwood level, right? And you've probably already seen this before yourself, right? You can take two people with a Norwood 3. And one guy, let's say person A, guy A, right, has super, super curly hair. Well, that super, super curly hair is leading to a greater area of coverage. So he can style his hair better to the point where you can't tell if he has an Norwood 3. He might appear to have an Norwood 2 or even an Norwood 1, depending on how curly and coarse and, you know, just how much coverage his hair can produce. Whereas if you have a guy that has very stringy hair, where the width is, you know, substandard, then it's going to look like an Ord 3. If not in some lighting conditions, cosmetically, it may even look worse than an Ord 3. So that is why hair width is a good measurement to kind of take into account. The global photography assessment and patient self-questionnaires corroborates the objective data here. Half of the patients on 0.05% topical dutasteride had a global photographic assessment score of at least plus two points at 12 weeks, rising to nearly 70% of people in that particular group by the end of the study at 24 weeks. Finasteride, by contrast, hovered closer to 20% at 24 weeks. Patient satisfaction, as measured by the male hair growth questionnaires, was similarly higher in the dutasteride 0.05% arm 
with over 90% reporting satisfaction with their hairline by week 24. And such concordance between the objective metrics and subjective satisfaction kind of strengthens the clinical credibility of the result. Now, something that I find to be interesting is that there were detectable but low-level concentrations of dutasteride that was in the plasma of the subjects that were using the topical dosing, with concentrations often close to the assay's lower limit of quantification. And this is important because while the results here were highly variable, these trace systemic levels indicate that the drug's absorption into the scalp tissue did indeed occur. There was a low but non-zero systemic exposure. Serum dihydrotestosterone or DHT and testosterone shifted only modestly with the topical dutasteride group. And it is in stark contrast to the well-documented approximately 90% serum DHT suppression that you would see with oral dutasteride at 0.5 milligram in benign prosthetic hyperplasia studies and androgenetic alopecia studies. Now, this is pretty important here because people like to cite dutasteride's molecular weight, which is approximately 528 Dalton, as being a major issue when it comes to its topical use. And this is due to the classic dermatology 500 Dalton rule. And people's perception of this rule is essentially that hey, once anything reaches 500 or above 500 Dalton, then it can't do anything for you. When it's more so a heuristic that signals at steeply diminishing passive permeation rather than an absolute barrier. So in other words, penetration only becomes harder, but not impossible if a molecule reaches 500 or above 500 Dalton. And there are other sort of things that can modulate the penetration of a molecule so you can increase the lipophilicity of a molecule, right? Now, dutasteride is already lipophilic with a log P around 5. And lipophilicity is important because if you have a lipophilic drug, then it can essentially get through the outer layer of the skins and potentially get to where you want it to be. But if it's too lipophilic, then it can't necessarily get into the serum as much, but that's not a bad thing because you don't want too much systemic exposure if that is your goal with topical dutasteride. So it can possibly go through the intrafollicular route and deposit itself around the sebaceous glands of the hair follicle where there it can slowly disseminate and ultimately reduce the 5-alpha reductase enzymes around the hair follicle. So that's actually what we want. There's also another principle that we kind of had a hint at in this specific study, and this is under Fick's law. So with Fick's law, if we increase the concentration of a particular molecule, then the weight of that molecule will essentially move it through a concentration gradient. That's just the rough way I'm going to put it. I've already made videos on this. I'll put them in the description below. But essentially, if we can get more concentration, a higher concentration, then that should render or at least assuage the high Dalton issue that we have with dutasteride's molecular weight. And we, again, kind of had that demonstrated in this specific study. Steady state flux scales with both the permeability coefficient and the donor to tissue concentration gradient. Here, we saw that the dose response in hair count gains across 0.01%, 0.02%, and 0.05% concentrations of topical dutasteride is exactly what we would expect to see, right? We would expect to see that as we increase the concentration, we possibly might get a dose-dependent response because more of that topical dutasteride is getting into the tissue and depositing itself around the hair follicle, but also more of that topical dutasteride is also getting into the serum as well which may have a greater impact on systemic suppression of DHT. But nevertheless, we're seeing Fick's law demonstrated that the higher the amount and concentration you have, the more that can actually get into the tissue and actually do some work. Now, of course, this doesn't go on forever. There probably is some sort of limit, whether it's due to the vehicle or whether it's due to there simply not being enough enzymes to inhibit anymore. But there's probably a limit where this kind of flatlines. So you can't increase the topical concentration to, let's say, 100% topical dutasteride because at some point 
it's not going to be, you know, there's not going to be a difference between, say, 5% topical dutasteride and 100% topical dutasteride. You've hit the maximal amount you can suppress through a topical means and perhaps within that tissue in general. We see this demonstrated with oral dutasteride use between 0.5 milligram up to 2.5 milligram. After 2.5 milligram, there's only so much you can suppress. There are so many diminishing returns that occur, even a bit before 2.5 milligram. Context matters when we compare these findings to established therapies. Against oral finasteride, 1 milligram in this specific six month window, in this specific study, topical dutasteride at 0.05% holds an advantage on hair counts with similar gains in hair width. That is clinically attractive, especially if you're somebody that is wary of systemic side effects. And I have to remind you though, we have more data on oral finasteride going up to 10 years. So still, it might be a risk to pin your hopes on topical dutasteride, especially at this seemingly low of a concentration. I've already made a video before, topical dutasteride at 0.1% concentration. And I have my suspicions that this specific concentration is a bit too low, but they have their own special formulation here. And that's something to take into account because the formulation actually does matter because the formulation might be improving the amount of topical dutasteride that can actually deposit into the hair follicles. So if you're using a different formulation of topical dutasteride, it, you might not get the same results as what's being described in this specific study. But admittedly, the, <laughs> the, the formulation that they're describing here isn't groundbreaking by any means. You can probably make this yourself. Again, not saying to do so, but it's pretty easy. They use dutasteride as the active pharmaceutical ingredient, then dehydrated alcohol. Next, they use medium chain triglycerides, and finally, castor oil. In the other studies that I have seen, they used 0.1% concentration of topical dutasteride in a sort of sophisticated liposomal encapsulation. But this study, they're using more so a lipid matrix with no liposomes, but still it might be the case that this sort of lipid matrix with castor oil and medium chain triglycerides and whatever is actually helping for the topical dutasteride to penetrate into the tissue properly. When it comes to safety and tolerability in this phase two snapshot, it's pretty reassuring. Local irritation scores were low, withdrawals for adverse events were absent, and laboratory signals were unremarkable. The endocrine footprint that topical dutasteride had was very small and consistent with the pharmacokinetics. Still, the exposure did have some variability, as we mentioned earlier, but overall, if I just had to put this video to a close and stop yapping so much, topical dutasteride has a signal of working. So it's an option that you guys can certainly use to help yourself fight against androgenetic alopecia. So that's it for this video. Hopefully my rambling, I felt like I was rambling more than often when it came to this particular paper because I've already done videos on this before and I've already answered these questions over and over again. And essentially I'm going through the principles once more, whether it's the 500 Dalton rule, log P, which reflects lipovelicity, or even fix law itself. I've already made videos on this that shows a signal, a sign that topical dutasteride at various concentrations may work. Now, if you want my opinion, I would say if you're not too concerned about systemic absorption, 0.1% is a sort of good starting point, And you can probably use it in this sort of lipid encapsulation or this sort of lipid matrix rather where you have castor oil, medium chain triglycerides, and other sort of encapsulation methods that could help take that dutasteride deeper into the hair follicle and help you out and retain your hair. So that's it. I'm done yapping. I don't want to say that it's better than oral finasteride because oral finasteride has more data on it, but it does look like it is a good therapy. So thanks for watching this video, guys, and I hope to see you in the next one. Peace out.